Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for taking us through the entire region uh, country-wise. And that in itself has opened up lots of uh, curiosity in all of us to continue with the discussion of today. Uh, so uh, when we look in the uh, when we look at the recent elections, uh, the thing that intrigued us from the prism of the Middle East and the U.S. Uh, relations was the silence by the Saudis right after the election results had come out. Uh, the prolonged for about 24, 24 hours, the Saudi leadership did not come out with any of the messages to the uh, Biden administration to be. So with this, uh, with this cue, I would like to uh, request uh, Professor Joseph Kishishan uh, uh, to, you know, to give his opinion or any questions to Professor Friedman. So over to you, sir. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to add something to uh, 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 Bob Friedman's overall excellent uh, summary of uh, the changes that could happen. And I was struck by his emphasis that uh, that the Biden administration will have as a priority human rights issues. And in fact, I was toying with this idea as I was listening uh, to him speak that although human rights obviously will be very high up on the Biden administration's agenda, there is also a lot of realism one has to take into account. Uh, I don't know whether or not this will be the case, but I think that the Biden administration's priorities will not be the Middle East. It will be the rest of the world. It will be Europe, uh, first and foremost. It will be Russia and China, uh, and perhaps as a fourth, as a fourth uh, item, uh, the Middle East. Even even though I'm willing to even down, downgrade that to fifth and sixth, but having said that, and I was struck by the fact that the Khashoggi assassination in Istanbul uh, continues to uh, um, to uh, preoccupy uh, American uh, officials to the degree that it is. It is an awful assassination, which has been now tried in a court of law, and people have found have been found guilty. And, and it was a huge, huge error that was committed. But the question is, and I would like to really get Bob Friedman's views on this. The question is, well, how long do you think, Bob, is the Khashoggi murder will be the uh, Damocles sword over the head of the Saudis? Will it be one administration? Will it be two administrations? Will it be three administrations? Uh, this is not the first assassination that has occurred uh, in, in the world, and it will not be the last, unfortunately. We don't say anything about the thousands of journalists, political prisoners assassinated and killed in Turkey, for example. Uh, in, 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 instead, we talk about the geostrategic position of Turkey, which is, of course, very important, as you rightly said. But again, you know, why, why do you think there is this huge preoccupation with the Khashoggi murder, putting aside all the other key elements in the relationship between Saudi Arabia and the United States? Okay, Joseph, very good question. Uh, if I may, I would like to go a little bit deeper in my answer to you. Remember, we keep getting information dribbled out on a regular basis. And who does the dribbling? The Turks. And the Turks are keeping this issue alive because part of Erdogan's strategy is to challenge the Saudis for leadership of the Sunni world, Sunni Muslim world. And the longer they can keep this alive, uh, the more the Saudis look bad. So you have to expect that the Turks will definitely keep this issue alive. Although you're absolutely right, if you look at the horrendous thing the Erdogan regime has done, jailing of, of Kurds, killing of Kurds, jailing of newspapermen who don't agree with the regime. You know, this is an ugly, it's an ugly regime, but in the game that Erdogan is playing, they, he wants to sort of restore, it's neo-Ottomanism. He wants to restore the Ottoman Empire as the great Sunni leader, uh, the Sunni Muslim leader. So I think you're going to have that on a regular basis, and they're going to try to keep it alive. And again, the human rights community in the United States, I think, picks up on this. And because the Trump administration totally downgraded human rights as an issue, except for the Uyghurs in China, because Trump wanted to hit China, uh, uh, I think 
there'll be some resonance. Will it outlast the end of the Biden administration? Probably not. I think there'll be a lot of other things. Now, in terms of your other point, which is also one I agree with, uh, in terms of priorities, um, and thanks for giving me the chance to get into this, I think from foreign policy, number one is going to rebuild ties with NATO, uh, because unnecessarily Trump hurt relations with NATO, personal attacks on Angela Merkel, personal attacks on Macron, personal attacks on Trudeau of Canada, for God's sakes, is America's number one and closest ally. I think that's gone. I think he's going to work very hard to rebuild relations. Um, in the case of Europe, they keep kicking around the idea, of course, that they're going to have a European army because they can't trust the United States to back them up. But I think that idea, I, th I think, will go down. And I wouldn't at all be surprised if Biden reverses the decision of pulling out those 12,000 troops from Germany, which Trump wanted to do to penalize the Germans for not paying enough to, for their own defense. So I think rebuilding ties with NATO, it's a low hanging fruit to be sure, doesn't require a lot of political capital because it's something Republicans, including Pence, by the way, the vice president has always been a big supporter of NATO, even if Trump is not. So I think that's going to be a, a number one priority. Uh, in terms of Russia, I'm not sure. Uh, I think there'll be a gesture or two, such as uh, for another five years, continuing the strategic arms agreement. It runs out in February, and the Russians are willing to continue it for five years. I think Biden be willing to, to continue it for five years while negotiating on something else. Uh, what Trump wanted to do was bring the Chinese in, and that the non-starter you know, for the Chinese and also for the Russians. So I think uh, sort of as is uh, extension for five years. And the uh, Trump administration wanted a closer check on the kinds of nuclear, tactical nuclear weapons that the uh, Russians have. I'm not sure Biden is going to push on that immediately but have that for, for negotiations. So I think that, again, a low, relatively low-hanging fruit and relatively easy to do. In terms of China, uh, as we were discussing before our seminar began, um, I think he will be use more deaf diplomacy than Trump did in, in trying to bind together an alignment in Asia with the United States against China and its activities in the South China Sea. Um, uh, the one thing Trump did do was build up Taiwan militarily and just another, you know, in the last few months, one arms deal after another arms deal after another arms deal, which will make it much more difficult for China to launch an attack uh, on Taiwan. Um, so I expect uh, that may be downplayed, the Taiwan issue may be downplayed, basically they're gonna let these arms deals go through, but then sort of downplay a little bit so as not to unnecessarily irritate China. That, that again remains to be seen. I know the Taiwanese are a little bit concerned about that. Uh, I'm hoping that relations with India will continue to improve uh, with Japan, with South Korea, some of the irritations that Trump did unnecessarily, I think, will be removed, such as the unnecessary fighting over the trade issue and over you know, financial support for American troops, because the North Korean issue still looms large. So I think if I had to list priorities, I would put number one, rebuilding ties with NATO, uh, and very close second to that, or perhaps equal, uh, rebuilding uh, the alignment in Asia and eliminating some of these personal issues or personality issues that Trump did. Uh, so I think these would be number two. Uh, what they can do with China remains to be seen. Uh, what Biden has said, if you take him at his words, uh, cooperate where possible, but draw lines where red lines were necessary. Now, we all know the story about Obama and the red line over the use by the Syrians of chemical weapons, hopefully Biden's red line will be more, uh, more of a red line. 
So I think some of the nastiness and tone from the Trump administration toward China will go down, but I don't see a huge improvement of relations so long as Xi is in power, Xi Jinping is in power in China. So then after you've gotten all this stuff out of the way, then I think the Iran, the Iran thing. So maybe I would put it forth. So, but again, Joe, thank you. Very good point. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so another country uh, that must be closely keeping a tap of the developments with regard to US and the Middle East could be Japan. So in view of this, may I request uh, Professor Tanaka to raise some of his uh, observations or questions to Professor Friedman. Well, thank you for the opportunity. And thank you, uh, Professor Friedman, for your excellent talk and clear, uh, clarifying the conditions that uh, President-elect uh, Biden is going to face in the coming month. Now, um, you've listed the priorities uh, when uh, Biden is going to take, uh, take office. And one thing that I think that you might have not mentioned or might have uh, slipped my mind or my ears was that the issue over the environment. Now, would Biden, uh, the, would the Biden administration take, uh, certainly he will take care more of the um, greenhouse gas emissions and all these stuffs more seriously, but how would that, be placed in his uh, domestic and also uh, energy policy. The problem here is that if he's going to curtail the shale development inside the United States, which has been uh, flourishing and blooming for the past several years, then the uh, possibility of the United States having its depend uh, self-dependency on fossil fuel and others is going to diminish, which in turn would bring the Middle Eastern uh, oil producers such as Saudi Arabia or even Iran to have sort of leverage or bargaining power against uh, in the foreign policy uh, arena uh, against the United States. So if it's going to prioritize the uh, energy issue and also slash environment issue uh, in the United States, that would eventually place the United States in a very vulnerable position uh, than, uh, than they, uh, they are today. How would, how would you see this equation? Okay, another really good question. Um, there is some low hanging fruit that he can do immediately. And then there's long, long range stuff. First of all, he can, by executive order, uh, get rid of a number of the executive actions that the Trump administration did, which is cut regulations on business, uh, cut regulations on coal mines, et cetera, et cetera. So he can reimpose this stuff, which he's very likely to do. Uh, he's going to rejoin the Paris Agreement uh, on climate change. I guess that is also... Uh, something easy to do. But your point on hydraulic fracturing and shale is important. Now, I've looked at the shale issue. Now, you can cleanly do hydraulic fracturing. If you double cement your pipes as they go down past the water line, and when the stuff comes up, a mixture of chemicals and water and pebbles, etc., you get rid of the stuff that comes up with it cleanly. Now, what, Trump, what Biden has said is no fracking, no hydraulic fracturing on uh, federal lands. He's not stopping it on private lands. Now, as a result of hydraulic fracturing, the United States moved from being 5 million barrel a day oil producer, and when Obama started, to over 12 million barrels, at least before the COVID crisis came. So the U.S. for a while was the number one producer of oil in the world, hence less dependent on foreigners. And the main dependence the U.S. has is on Canada. The U.S. gets 3 million plus barrels a day of oil from Canada as the main import source. But other than that, it's a net exporter. Um, I think this is going to be a slow process. Now, he's going to be prodded by the, the green movement within the Democratic Party. One of the big Biden challenges, remember, he ran as a moderate and one is a moderate. And he won the so-called Rust states of Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania, the so-called Rust Belt states that were taken by Trump four years ago because he was a moderate. And while the Trump administration tried to convince everybody that he was a socialist, he was basically a moderate. So in order to govern, uh, he's going to have to keep the moderation, which will cause increasing frustration 
by this another quad, a group of ultra progressives in the Democratic Party, Ilhan Omar, AOC, and others, and Bernie Sanders, they're going to be pushing for more rapid uh, environmental change, so-called green revolution. Um, I think he's going to moderate that. So I don't see and I don't see hydraulic fracturing st stopping immediately. It'll continue on private lands. Uh, so I don't see, uh, and we have to wait for the COVID to stop and then more uh, demand to build up, of course. Uh, so I don't see the U.S. In going back on being highly dependent on the Middle East for oil again. Uh, um, I simply don't see that. So uh, we'll see. But again, good, good question. Well, thank you, Professor. It's quite clear for me now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, may I also request our, our, our India's former ambassador to Iran, Sanjay Sir, to raise some of his views on the, on the topic. Thank you. Uh, thank you for so uh, eloquently listing down the priorities of the, for the Biden administration. And I hear you that uh, uh, one, that the Middle East is not going to be very high on the list of priorities. But I also hear that uh, human rights and human security may be. In that context, there are some things that cannot wait, which are possibly disasters in, in, the, in the realm of human security. And I am thinking about Yemen. Will the Biden administration take up Yemen and the humanitarian problem in Yemen and deal with this as an immediate problem. All right, that's a very challenging question because in dealing with Yemen, of course, you're dealing with the Saudis who are a US ally on the one end and the uh, Iranians backing the Houthis on the other. And it's a very complex situation in Yemen. Um, I think that's not going to be high on the priority list of the Biden administration. Uh, we talk about low-hanging fruit. That's an extremely high-hanging fruit to, to try to get a solution to the Yemeni issue. Um, it may just have to uh, play itself out. The only possible change that might happen is if the Houthis continue to fire rockets into Saudi Arabia, possibly hitting some oil installations that the Iranians give them, then the U.S. might have to get more heavily involved. But barring that, I don't think it's a priority that the uh, Biden administrations want to get into because it requires a huge amount of capital, political capital to do, and the payoff at the end is questionable. Uh, human rights notwithstanding, and people starving notwithstanding, and, and so forth. Uh, this might be a case where the Europeans who keep looking for things to do uh, might get more usefully involved, uh, and the U.S. might deputize the Europeans here uh, to try to do that. But I don't see it as a high priority, unfortunately. Thank you, Professor. Uh is there anybody uh, who would like to? Oh, yeah. So we have a question. Yes, Mudasa, I'll come to you. Uh, we have a question from Dara Shah. Uh, Dara, if you just unmute yourself and ask Professor your question. Thanks, Al White. Um, uh, Professor Friedman, I just wanted to ask your views on how receptive are the states that uh, uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo will be visiting shortly? He's announced a, he's announced a seven nation tour beginning with Paris and then like the three allies in the Middle East, how receptive are these nations going to be to his visit and what sort of outcomes can we really expect? Well, um, I think it's, uh, there, there's a term in English in the United States, lame duck. And for those of you not familiar with it, it's somebody on the way out that has very little clout. So, um, I think it's going to be an attempt to try to reassure these countries that 
even though Biden is going to come in. And of course, I'm sure you heard Pompeo yesterday saying, perhaps tongue in cheek, that it'll be a second Trump administration, although that's very hard to believe. Uh, I, I think it's a question of reassurance. In case of Israel, um, with the F-35 just going through to UAE, I think there's a question of the qualitative military edge, which um, Trump has promised and Biden has promised. Uh, the kind of compensation Israel's going to get for that, possibly the, v, the, the 22, V-22 uh, vertical takeoff uh, plane as, as partial compensation remains to be seen. And I think they go to Saudis and they go to UAE and so forth, and they're just going to try to reassure them uh, that things won't change all that much. Uh, I'm not sure how much attention is being paid, except in Israel where they're going to want the arms um, uh, and how much clout Pompeo has with two months to go before he's out of office. Now, I, I don't want to minimize these last two months because remember the last two months, the Obama-Biden administration, the U.S. abstained on the U.N. Security Council resolution condemning Israel on the settlements, uh, which caused a huge stir. So I'm not saying they can't do anything. Uh, but I, I don't see a huge amount coming out of this other than arms deals and arms sales. Thank you, Professor. Uh, may I request Mudassir to come up with this question? Uh, thank you, Professor. It was great to listen to you. Uh, and uh, I have two short questions. Uh, one is uh, the point which uh, Professor Kishishian actually mentioned during his question about the listening, and you were also mentioning during the presentation that there would be less, you know, uh, kind of focus on the Middle East as far as US foreign policy is concerned. So will that mean, I mean, if compared to the Obama administration, will that mean more involvement of Russia in the Middle East? And, you know, you were also perhaps uh, indicating towards that during your presentation, Maybe you can uh, kind of elaborate on that. And the second point was, uh, you know, we had a discussion uh, earlier, you know, in an earlier week when Professor Ephraim Mba was here. And one of the points uh, which came during the discussion was the uh, Netanyahu, uh, the Prime Minister Netanyahu not meeting, you know, Biden, the Democratic candidate during the entire, you know, campaign period. Will that, how far that will affect, uh, you know, the relationship between Israel and the US or can one, one say that, was that a mistake as far as the bipartisan, you know, relations is concerned? Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, very good. Thank you. Um, let me answer them in, in, uh, in order. Um, the Russians entry into the Middle East was primarily made possible by acts of omission or commission by the United States. I've already mentioned what happened in Egypt, the misplaying of the coup by Sisi sort of invited them in. When the US essentially cozied up to Iran with the JCPOA agreement and President Obama given the feeling that, well, we should treat the Saudis and the Iranians the same, that moved the Saudis closer to the Russians and that was reinforced by the oil agreement member of 2016, moved the UAE closer, the UAE agreed to buy some weapons, et cetera, and certainly moved the Russia, the Israelis closer. Uh, Israel, you know, on a major UN resolution, if you might remember, condemning the Russians for the uh, invasion of Afghanistan, uh, of Crimea, abstained, essentially. So there was a shift there to the Russians. Now, if the Biden administration once again cozies up to Iran, and as I'm saying it's going to be very difficult, then again, I see this, what I call the reinsurance effort of these countries to move closer to the Russians. Uh, but since I don't see a lot of success in that endeavor of cozying up to Iran, in part because the Iranian elections are coming up, remember, in June, and it's going to be hard for any Iranians, either conservatives or the moderates, to make gestures to the U.S. 
and whether the U.S. can make some concessions. Uh, there'll be a lot of op opposition to that in the U.S. in lifting even partial sanctions. Uh, I don't see that happening. So I think the U.S. is, is, is not going to leave the Middle East. In other words, the U.S. is going to maintain its bases in Qatar and Bahrain and its very close relationship with, with Israel and close relationship with Saudi Arabia and still working relationship with Egypt. Um, I don't see the U.S. giving that up. It's just that more emphasis will be placed uh, on rebuilding ties with NATO allies on the one hand, uh, you know, containing China in Asia, you know, on the other, and a more hard-headed policy uh, toward Russia. So I see where the emphasis will be different. I don't see the U.S. leaving. Uh, so the Russians, of course have the, a lot of interests in the Middle East, uh, primarily Syria, but they're having their own problems in the Middle East. Uh, keeping control of or trying to control the Syrians, the, the Iranians uh, and the Turks in Northern Syria is not an easy task. Uh, and they're trying to get a transitional council going and the Assad regime doesn't want to go for it. Uh, so, and plus, they have lots of domestic problems. So I don't see huge Russian breakthroughs in the Middle East either. So that's that's that. Now, in terms of your second question, that's the fascinating one, I think, because if Netanyahu made any mistake and he made a number, but his biggest mistake as prime minister was shifting attitudes in the United States about Israel from being bipartisan, which they really were through the end of the Bush administration, to being highly partisan. And you have now Republicans, 80% 80, 80 pro-Israel, Democrats at best 50%. And this is because of the constant clashes between Netanyahu and Obama. And then you have the close personal tie between Trump, who most Democrats have war, uh, and Netanyahu, and that just exacerbated the, the problem of partisanship. So I think that is going to be an issue. Uh, now, Biden is a longtime friend of Israel, um, so hopefully he can get over that, but I think a lot of Democrats won't. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, sir. Uh, may I also request Professor Ramakrishnan from the Center for West Asian Studies, uh, who's with us now. Sir, if you are there, can you uh, unmute yourself? And uh, I'll pass. Uh, I, I, I'm keenly listening to okay. the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I request uh, Dr. Moinuddin uh, uh, to unmute and pose a question to Pro Professor Friedman? Thank you, Professor Friedman, for this uh, lecture. Uh, my question is uh, only regarding Israel. Uh, sir, uh, we have seen that, uh, you know, uh, Israel is not quite sure what to do with the settlements. And you had mentioned it uh, in the beginning as well. Now, with the coming of, uh, you know, Joe Biden as the president of United States, what do you think uh, uh, the policy of Israel will be in terms of, uh, you know, the settlements in West Bank particularly? Thank you. Professor, before you go on to this question, uh, I can club with another question. We have a, a similar question raised by an audience, Kavita. If, Kavita, if you can unmute yourself and uh, raise the query to Professor. Yeah, hello. Thanks for this opportunity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I wanted to know uh, that what will be the Biden administration's take on Palestine issue? given that Joe Biden has already commented that if he's elected, uh, U.S. will be leaving the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. And as Dr. Friedman had just discussed that uh, Israel had, you know, uh, Netanyahu had put all his eggs in the Republican basket. So what will be Joe Biden administration's take? Thank you. Okay, again, very good questions. Um, let me start with the settler issue. Um, in recent weeks, there's been a proliferation of settlement building or settlement authorization. In other words, housing and settlements. Remember, there are two 
places on the West Bank. There's within the barrier, uh, the anti-terror barrier, where 77% of the settlers live, uh, and the scattered settlements near highly populated Palestinian cities and towns. Now, what the settlers are trying to do in the last two months of the Trump administration is get as many settlements in as possible before Biden comes in. And uh, I'm reminded of the story which I saw when I was in Israel in 2009. Uh, I went to a place called Mala Dumim, which is on the hilltop overlooking uh, the road down to Jericho uh, and the Dead Sea. And you had Kadum there. And then right at the top of the hill, uh, not too far from Kadum, you had Mala Dumim, Kadum, and there was just the beginnings of another settlement there. And I went up and I talked to the guard. And I asked, is this going to be another settlement? And this was 2009, and this was June. And what the guard told me was only if your president, meaning Obama, lets us do it. So every time I'm in Israel, I go back and I go and, and visit and visit and visit. And of course, during the Trump administration, uh, when I was there, it was already a booming little village. So it's very clear that Biden will oppose it. Uh, now, he won't cut security aid to Israel over that issue, although there will be a lot of pressure from the progressives within the Democratic Party uh, to do that. Um, but I think that will be an issue of friction. And to avoid the friction, I think the settlers are trying to get as much done now uh, until January 20th. Uh, but I think it will be, as it was in the Obama administration, a serious issue of friction. Uh, between the American administration under Biden and Netanyahu and his settler base. Now, in terms of the Palestinians, uh, again, uh, Abbas made, I think, a big, a big mistake when he totally cut off negotiations with the United States, um, because all that did was encourage Netanyahu to go further, which he did. Uh, I think with the new administration, especially if it opens the PLO office in, in Washington and sets up a, uh, an office in Jerusalem to deal with the West Bank, the way it was under all administrations prior to Trump, uh, these will be some major gestures to the Palestinians, which will enable Abbas to come back in negotiations. Now, what Abbas has said is he wants an international conference with members of another quad of the diplomatic quad of the EU, Russia, uh, the UN and the United States to work out a peace agreement. Uh, whether that will get off the ground remains to be seen. But again, I think you're gonna have the contacts between the Biden administration and the Palestinians, something you haven't had in the Trump administration. Now, whether that will go, how much, how far that will go remains to be seen. Meanwhile, there's very slow efforts at some sort of reconciliation between Hamas and Palestinian Authority under Abbas. And supposedly there's going to have elections, although we haven't seen the rules on that yet. Um, so if there's a unified Palestinian front, that will clearly strengthen the Palestinian bargaining position. The problem is the Hamas people and Palestinian Authority people don't like each other very much. And you add to that the succession battle going on. Abbas is 85 and not healthy. And uh, I don't think you're going to see a lot of progress on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict until there's a new Palestinian leadership, probably a new Israeli leadership, and an American president who's willing and able to push it through. Right now, you have Netanyahu, who doesn't want an agreement. Abbas, who's too weak and too ill and too old to push through an agreement, and Biden, who has too much on his plate right now and to devote a huge amount of personal presidential time to pushing through an agreement as opposed to solving the COVID problem, the economic problems in the United States. So I think that's where we are right now.
Thank you, sir. Uh, may I request uh, Kumar Swami, sir, to uh, intervene? And, and I couldn't uh, control the temptation of Professor Friedman. And uh, if I observe the relationship between uh, Netanyahu and uh, Obama, it was basically lack of personal warmth. Policy differences are much minor than the lack of war. And I think that complicated everything. My question is, given the Biden's approach of being inclusive, accommodative, you know, more uh, um, in terms of uh, uh, receptive to people, will that make the chemistry different between him and Netanyahu? Because that was a problem with Obama. Or are you seeing okay. this will be Obama 3.0? Um, oh, you're, you know, you hit the nail on the head. If, if you look at the picture of the first meeting of, of Obama on the one hand and Netanyahu on the other in May of 2009, Here's Obama sitting there with his arms crossed, and here's Netanyahu sitting there with his arms crossed, both very tense. Personal chemistry was totally missing. That having been said, there were serious policy problems too. One, Obama made the decision that in order to move the peace process forward, he had to distance himself from Israel. So his first trip to the Middle East was Saudi Arabia and Egypt, and before that had been Turkey, but no Israel. So that didn't go very well. The other policy issue, and this was a big mistake that Obama made, was that in April of 2004, uh, Sharon and uh, then President George W. Bush uh, had reached an agreement. The Israelis were going to pull out of Gaza. In return, the U.S. said that it realizes that in any final settlement, the reality is on the ground, that is the settlement blocks, would, would have to be taken in consideration as you know, part of Israel. So when Obama called immediately for the stop of settlement construction or housing construction in the settlements anywhere, that sort of violated this agreement between uh, Sharon and, and George W. Bush. And that was a big policy difference. And even though Obama was told, and I know this from uh, J Street, which is a progressive pro-Israeli lobby group, uh, where they had a meeting with Obama and they urged him to go to Israel. Uh, and he didn't go until the beginning of the second term. Um, I think the, these are policy, these are policy differences. Uh, personality, yes. Personal chemistry, you're absolutely right. But there's some serious policy differences too. Now, in the case of Biden, I don't think you're going to have the... Uh, personality differences because Biden and Netanyahu know each other. It's not the new boy on the block, you know, meeting Netanyahu. It's these guys know each other. Uh, but I think the policy differences will remain, especially over the settlements. And especially if there's an attempt by the U.S. under Biden to go back into the JCPOA agreement. Thank you, Professor. Uh Sir, I would like to ask a question, but uh, I can see a similar question up on my screen from Professor Guy Burton. When we talk about the Middle East uh, and the US, uh, the third party factor, China, uh, has been very visible from the early 90s onwards. In fact, I wrote my thesis on this and where your, many of your works have helped me in formulating my arguments. Uh, the third party intervention, uh, with regard to Israel-China relations have become very prominent, particularly in the last couple of years. So uh, clubbing this question together, may I request uh, Professor Guy Burton to raise your, uh, your, your queries to Professor Friedman. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, Professor Friedman, for the presentation. And I appreciate uh, you, um, being, being allowed to ask this. Now, it's a very quick question, which is that the last, we've seen over the last year or so, uh, the United States becoming much more uh, pressing on its allies and partners in the region. Israel is obviously the most uh, notable example, but there's also been um, some, some persuasion of the Egyptians um, to not have the Chinese engage in, in their, sorry, engage in, in their 5G network, um, possibly even extending to the Gulf at some point. Now, in your presentation, you said that the Middle East is not going to be a priority for, 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 for Biden, but, you know, 
are they really willing to cede the ground to potentially China here? So how do they sort of maintain, you know, uh, sort of, I mean, and I and I get. I also think on the other side there is a Chinese perspective, which sort of which I think people like Fan Hongda, who have suggested that they don't want to play this game. They, that China should try and avoid um, sort of getting sucked into the Middle East as a theatre of competition. So I wonder whether we might see a different change, or will we see just continuity. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Guy. Again, good questions on China. You know. You're dealing with two things when you're dealing with China. First of all, you're dealing with resources. Uh, the Chinese import still lots of oil from Iran, from Saudi Arabia, and they're very worried about the lines of communication through the Indian Ocean, through the Straits of Malacca, et cetera. And they're worried about in case of war, the U.S. could interdict these lines of communication. That's why they've been busy building pipelines through Central Asia, uh, to get that oil and natural gas. So this is, this is number one. The question is, in the case of China, it's dealings with Israel. You know, these go back a ways. Uh, at one point in 2000, uh, there was a combined Russian-Israeli AWACS, Airborne Warning and Control System plane, that was going to be sold to China, but the U.S. nixed that and said no. Right now, the issue is Haifa port. The uh, Chinese have been given the right to develop Haifa port. The, the problem there is Haifa port is a, basically uh, a home port for the American Sixth Fleet. And, uh, you know, the Australians have the same problem. They gave the Chinese the right to develop Darwin up north. And this is a place where American Marines rotate in and out and uh, as a base also for the U.S. So at, at one point, the push is going to come to shove, and the uh, Israelis are going to be told by the U.S., if you, want to make, if you want to continue to get a lot of military aid from us, it's $3.8 billion a year now, uh, you've got to sever your ties with the Chinese, at least in, in dealing with Haifa. And I think that's uh, the Israelis are pushing back on that. But that may be an issue of friction. Was it one of the few areas of friction under the Trump administration? And I think it may grow into a bigger bit of frustration now. Now, that having been said, uh, there's been a lot of talk about this new deal between Iran and China, uh, a 25-year deal. Um, the question is that since October, the Iranians are now free to buy weapons anywhere they want to because uh, the UN embargo has been lifted. Uh, will the Russians sell the weapons? Will the Chinese sell the weapons? Anybody who does sell the weapons, any companies involved, will immediately become sanctioned by the United States. So they've been holding off a little bit on this. Um, if I'm sitting and I'm advising China, and I'm advising the government of China, and I'm facing a real and growing clash between the Saudis on the one hand and the Iranians on the other, it does not pay to come down on one side or the other if you want to guarantee your supply of oil from both. So I think they're going to still try to maintain their neutrality on the one hand while pushing their belt and road policy, uh, you know, ports all through the Indian Ocean, uh, which obviously challenges India uh, to get their exports through, et cetera. So I don't see the, the Chinese, other than economically, uh, becoming yet a, a big political force in the Middle East. Um, certainly not a dominant political force, at least in the near future. Um, we'll see. I mean, Xi, Xi Jinping has lots of ambition, uh, but the Middle East is a very complex place. And the Uyghur issue may loom large again, especially because the Turks are pushing it now. Um, so we will see. But as of now, I don't see the U.S. ceding the, the Middle East to, uh, to China again. Just because the Middle East may not be as high a priority for mm. the Biden administration as perhaps it was under previous administrations, does not mean that the U.S. is giving up on the Middle East. 
I think, let me make that point very clear. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we have another question from a very young researcher here, Pratmesh. Uh, Pratmesh, if, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask Professor your question. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, my question is, will President Biden recognize Jerusalem to be the only capital of Israel, whole of Jerusalem, or will he push for a settlement on East Jerusalem? Thank you. Um, well, tactically, uh, by not moving the embassy back uh, to Tel Aviv, he's essentially saying that Jerusalem is the capital of of uh, of Israel. However, even Trump, remember, when he moved the capital, said this does not in any way say our position on the final status of Jerusalem. So I think that's still going to be up in the air and uh, depends on, again, those three things that I mentioned. Palestinian leaders strong enough who wants peace, Israeli leaders strong enough who wants peace, and an American president who's strong enough and is able to push through and make the peace possible. And you don't have those now. All you can do is the little things. Thank you, sir. Uh, do we have any other queries uh, uh, from the audience? Uh, I think we are, lot, we are having a lot of interest uh, with the discussion going on right now. I think, uh, if there is anybody who would like to Raise any question? I think we can. So, all right, Professor, uh, I would say that uh, we have had a very, very interesting session today. Uh, I think it's very rare that we cover uh, almost all the countries ranging from China to you know Russia to Syria to Yemen under one uh, discussion. Uh, and I think we, all of us would agree that we have had a very engaging session uh, encapsulating a, a whole gamut of the issues with regard to the Middle East and when it comes to the U.S. also. So thank you, sir, for taking out your time and being with us today. And we look forward to having you more again. And with these few words, uh, I would hand over to Professor Kumar Swami. So.